Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elise Anderson. In our show this time, Think Tech's Ian Davidson showcases more of the stories our volunteer hosts are covering on the street. We'll hear what people are saying about the efforts to remove the Pacific Paradise shipwrecked in Waikiki. Senator Daniel Kaka shares stories that helped shape his career, and we'll take a peek at what may be the only coffee tree growing right in the middle of downtown Honolulu. So here we go, back on the street with Ian Davidson. Thanks, guys, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Ian Davidson. One of the great things about working here at Think Tech is working with our volunteer hosts. They come in, they tell us that they want to produce a story, and we go out and help them do that. This week, we've got a few of those stories to share with you. Um, we're really excited about them. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy. My name is Nat Bledder, and our company is Madre Chocolate, and we're the first bean-to-bar chocolate company on Oahu. So that means we take these cacao beans and turn them into chocolate bars that are now winning multiple international awards. So tell us now, I just discovered, as you were saying, that these, this is the, that comes from the tree? Yeah, this is the cacao fruit. Uh, they grow on the tree. We actually have a few in our backyard here uh, in Chinatown. So we're growing Chinatown cacao. Um, and uh, we get most of our cacao from North Shore of Oahu, uh, Windward Side, and Big Island. Um, and we or the farmer will take these fruit, crack them open, take out all the delicious uh, lychee tasting pulp that surrounds the seeds, and ferment those for about a week, uh, which is the most important part of the process that no one ever hears about. And then, and then we'll uh, dry them, age them, roast them, crack, winnow, conch, temper, and wrap them. So it's only 12 steps in two months from this fruit to a finished chocolate bar. How long have you been doing this? I've been making chocolate for about 10 years, and Madre Chocolate is almost seven years old now. This seems like, well, everybody eats chocolate and uses chocolate for any number of things. Mm -hmm. How did you come with this special Madre chocolate that's s s winning awards and so much better than everybody else's? How did that happen? Um, a big part of it is uh, understanding and respecting the history of chocolate from where it was invented in Latin America uh, and working really closely with the farmers in Hawaii. Uh, and, and around the world for that fact. Um, so since the farmer is usually doing the ferment and that contributes about three quarters of the flavor to the final chocolate bar, uh, you, we need to work with the farmers to make sure it goes the best way possible. And in Hawaii, cacao has only been grown for about 20 years in any large scale, so no one can learn from their ancestors how to do the ferment. So we've gone to Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, uh, Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, and studied how it's traditionally fermented and brought that knowledge back here. You said uh, the history, how long have mankind been making chocolate? Uh, the earliest record we have now is about 4,000 years ago in uh, Honduras, uh, by the, even before the Maya or the Olmec, probably their, their predecessors. So it's pretty old. And so since the people in, in Central America have been working with chocolate for 4,000 years, we think they probably know what flavors to combine with it that work well. So we do a lot of those traditional flavors like uh, chili chocolate, and um, we use another fruit called a jaguar cacao that's traditionally mixed with, with chocolate in Central America. On, on First Fridays and other special events, we do drinking chocolate, and I'm about to go to the Northwest Chocolate Festival in Seattle and I'm give a talk on traditional uh, drinking chocolate, because that's how chocolate was originally conceived, as a drink, not, not as a bar. Well, they don't grow any cacao in Europe, so when you say European chocolate, that means it was just made there. The beans always come from the tropics. So uh, up until recently, it's been difficult to make chocolate where the cacao grows. So um, Hawaii is one of the first places that's happening where we have the cacao farmers and the chocolate makers right next to each other. So that can never happen in Europe, so you don't get this closed feedback loop that we have here for really improving the cacao very quickly. My name is Dante Tanner, and you're watching Think Tech on Spectrum OC16.
Hi, Carol Cox here down at Waikiki, Kaimana Beach. Going to talk to people about uh, the recent sinking of the Pacific Paradise, a longline fishing boat that ran aground here some weeks ago and is presenting a very serious health problem, environmental problem, busting up the reef, introducing oil. Uh, we don't know when the boat is going to be removed, so we're going to ask some questions and get some comments from the public. So come on and join us. Uh, I've swam down here for 50 years. Uh huh. And for two days I smelled oil in the water, but that's gone away. And it might have been because the waves were getting, going over the boat and sloshing what oil was inside. Mm -hmm. uh, my opinion, like everyone has one, right. about how they should handle it. I swim here every day is the first day I was here, which was the first day I was on the reef, the boat was just teetering there. It wasn't stuck badly, but the waves came and it drove it further up onto the coral reef. This is what I figured have. Mm -hmm. I would have been there the first day with three or four tugboats. Tugboats, not, yeah. not light no, boats. Tugboats. Something boat. with torque. I would have had three or four tugboats and pulled it off right mm -hmm. then and there. They had their chance because I don't think there was a hole in it. Mm -hmm. I'm just guessing. Right. That's my opinion. So but do you think, in your honest opinion, do you think this matter was handled properly or efficiently? And we'll geez. say that. We won't be critical. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, efficiently <laughs> or they could have done better? All I could say is they should have had three or four tugs the first day there, All right. and they didn't. So, okay. yeah, and, and that's so, what I think they should have done. Uh, do you think that this poses a risk to the, the coral reef there and anything else that's in, in here as it sits now? I don't, maybe where it's sitting, but I don't see how it's going to destroy anything else. It's just mm -hmm. the coral upon, it's the coral upon which the ship sits. Mm -hmm. The boat's only 70 feet long. So. And, uh, by the way, what was the purpose of this boat and its voyage? Do you, have you heard anything about it? I've heard it? conflicting stories. One, that they were bringing fishermen here mm -hmm. from Samoa, who, and they in turn came from the Philippines and uh, Indonesia and Vietnam. And I also heard that they were transporting illegals. So mm -hmm. there's been two stories in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what's happening on that score. But uh, Well, it should have never happened. You know, there's a lot of mysteries. People don't know still don't know to this day, you know, why it crashed, mm -hmm. you know, what what happened, the, the motor die, you know, did they scuttle it? Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's a shame. It's right on a nice reef where there's a surf break and, you know. So uh, do you have any concerns that it, by laying there now it might break up in the future and then present a problem for the coral, the surfing? Do you think it will impact the break? Uh, I think so. Is it um, having an influence on it now, you think? I know. Kent might know the lifeguard here, but it's a solid metal hull, so I don't think it's going to break up anytime soon. But mm -hmm. the coral, being much softer, is going to take the brunt of the toll. Mm -hmm. You know, every time there's a storm or Kona winds, it's going to move around and crush the coral heads even worse. So, so it's great if they get it out of there. What are some the of the rumors you hear about the, of it being here? Just rumors. as you, I've heard a number of them. What have you heard? Um... I don't not well. I don't know if you call them rumors, but just what I've been reading in the paper. You know that 20 guys on board, 20 on board. sleeps 10, and came back from you know the south, but with no fish and all that. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Just a lot of sort of uh, unanswered questions. And They've even tossed some of our legislators have even tossed it, the suspicion that it was human trafficking and. Uh, Slave labor. Is, <laughs> have you seen anything uh, indicate that? Uh, I don't know. That's you know the immigration IIC would know more about that, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I do. It's. I understand. It's probably more difficult than we might imagine to remove it from the reef. It's quite an operation, I guess. But yeah, I was just out there. I could taste diesel fuel in the water. It was. Who knows, you know, the, the damage that's happening to the environment and the reef. Mm -hmm. So, so they, they say an estimated 1,500 gallons still remains on the boat. That was as of last week. So you today tasted oil, uh, diesel, yeah. as you're surfing? And I most certainly did. I Actually, first time I was curious and sort of paddled up close to check it out. And mm -hmm. there's a strong taste of smell and taste of diesel in the water. Well, I think it needs to be handled uh, as a tourist. Like now knowing that, it's kind of concerning to go in the water. Yeah. But 
and all like the fact that it's affecting the marine life as well. I think that the ship needs to be dealt with and shouldn't just stay out there. Yeah. And and this is beautiful Waikiki. Oh, it's stunning. It is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. It is yeah. Even with the bad impression. I know. Yeah. I knowing what's on the boat. Yeah. yeah. That's concerning to me. Yeah, for sure. It is a it is a really negative environment impact. If they got the oil out, they could leave the boat. But other than mm -hmm. that, if there's still oil on the boat, I suggest that they get it out of here as soon as they can. Yeah, we so. have a lot of those up in Alaska. You know, when people are out, you know, crab fishing and things like that, and they lose their boats in mm -hmm. some of the craziest ways you can imagine. But yeah. you know, it's. You know, most of them are unsalvageable because they're in fairly deep water and they get swamped and then sink. You know? But you are in agreement that this is no place for a no. sunken boat. No, because it's, right it's just going to make a me it's just going to make a bigger mess when it breaks up. All right. Um, probably like 40 yards away, you can really start smelling it. But mm -hmm. smelling like it's more of just like where everything's been burned, just the smell of burnt plastic and burnt plastics and diesel oil. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Did you feel it on your skin or anything when you come in? No. So one gentleman said he was out there surfing and he'd actually taste it and swallow yeah. some of it. And then yeah. someone else said about a half well, mile down. Not drinking the water, so. Yeah, but you know it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a surfer, you know, you're going yeah. for it. But, uh, I mean, I imagine they've done all that they could do. We've kind of watched it. I, after I flew the drone over, you could see the whole front end submerged in the water. So it's kind of... We actually saw the fire actually yeah, about a week I, or two after I the fire. I personally don't think that they have made the best effort that they could because we've had multiple days where they could have made an attempt to remove it. Um, we called the fire department one night because there was a fire on board and we could literally see the flames from our room and they let it burn all night instead of, I don't know, trying to put it out. Fire department said it's a Coast Guard issue, so they don't even report or aren't following up after that point. And then, like the next day, they came out with the helicopter to put put the fire out. When I feel like they could have done that the night before and then attempted to remove the boat the next day. I don't know. It just it's not. It doesn't seem like it's been the best effort to pull the boat out to me right. and to prevent protect the environment because I know they've taken off fuel and stuff like that which is I mean thank God for that but um, with the fire and everything it just doesn't seem like they've done enough they've done enough yeah Already, we're standing back of uh, the outrigger canoe club and you're looking out over my shoulder there you'll see the Pacific Paradise a vessel that ran aground more than two weeks ago and we're down here just to try and gather some information what people saw and what they know and what do they think if asking the questions, did the state health department, the state land and natural resources, the United States Coast Guard do enough, quick enough to have prevented this? Hi, I'm Ann Kobayashi, and you're watching Think Tech Hawaii on Spectrum OC16. I feel really blessed because I had a father who was uh, Chinese and Hawaiian. Um, <clears throat> His father came from China, from Fukien. And this was in the 1800s. Now, he's one of the early Chinese. And he came to Hawaii and, of course, got married to a Hawaiian girl. And that's where it, it came from. And um, uh, my mother was a pure Hawaiian. And she came from the area in Pearl City. And uh, those two parents were very devout, um, relatively soft-spoken, treated us with love. As a matter of fact, my mother's tombstone has uh, aloha kea kua, 
And in Hawaiian means God is love. And so, in a way, that was the basis of our, our family. And when I came along, I was the eighth child <laughs> of the family. And, um, and uh, I would say that my brothers and si siblings, brothers and sisters, um, did real well for themselves, uh, including uh, the person uh, of uh, Reverend Akaka. Reverend Abraham Akaka. Yeah, Ab Abraham Akaka was minister of Kwaiho Church. Brother Abe, again, you know, taking the family spirit, really um, made differences with people. And uh, I uh, always considered him uh, the quiet rebel <laughs> because he, he was one that didn't scream or yell or he, he spoke softly, but his ideas were rebel <laughs> ideas that um, brought changes to Hawaii. Uh, the late 1950s and 60s, I was at Ever Beach Elementary School, and it had opened a new school because the population was growing out there. And so I had a part in a growing, growing community. As a matter of fact, um, uh, the school that's there, that's, that's called Pohakea, is a school that I opened. Uh, I, I was uh, vice principal at uh, Ever, uh, Elementary, Ever Beach Elementary. And uh, after spending there three years under three different principals, uh, I was asked to be a principal and uh, that uh, there would be a need of a new school out there. And so I accepted it, and, and uh, so what I did was I um, selected a name, and I talked to my dad about this, and, and I always thought of... Um, of uh, education as a means of, um, of uh, enlightenment, seeing a new light. And so um, selected the name Poha Kea. And in Hawaiian, Poha means to break forth. And Kea is light. So when you put it together, it's, it's enlightenment and believe that um, the process of education enlightens people's lives. And so basically, um, that was um, how I felt about, uh, about education. Governor Burns called me in. And he said, I, w I want you to work for me. And uh, I hesitated. I even told him no, that I was uh, doing something, you know, in communities that I think will be helpful. And uh, he said, and that's why I'm asking you. He said, I want to offer you opportunities to help more people than you're helping now, you know, I couldn't refuse that. So I left education <laughs> and I worked for Governor Burns and he was the one that, <clears throat> that the one day called me in and he said, you must run for office. You know, now when we go back to that, um, when I first got there as a freshman, 
somehow mom ma came back to me and you know and I said Chi Aloha Kea and so I vowed that I would be um um and and work up there and be um an example of Aloha. And so I would tell you I I I worked at that all the years I was there. And uh so Aloha me it meant so much to me and my work. But you know, I sh I must tell you that that I've discovered Aloha as really powerful. It makes differences. It makes things happen. It brings people together to help you. Um, it uh, brings a kind of relationship uh, that's uh, uh, trustful. And so, so many things come out of that. And and so the the power of, of aloha. And there's lots more on the street too on ThinkTech. Check it out at thinktechhawaii.com. And now let's take a look at our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash audio. And we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or better yet, sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisory for the daily docket of our movies and shows. Think Tech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our programs, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment, call 808-374-2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. More than ever, ThinkTech lives on the Internet. And yes, in its ongoing efforts to push the innovation envelope, ThinkTech is getting into crowdfunding. Here's an example of an animated video in our current Give Thanks to ThinkTech fund drive. We're at the midpoint in our month of November campaign, Give Thanks to ThinkTech. Please help us reach our goal of raising $40,000 so that we can continue to provide Hawaii's only digital media platform, streaming 35 hours a week of information, ideas, and news to our community. We extend our thanks to you for supporting Think Tech Hawaii, and we wish you and your families a Thanksgiving full of aloha. And here's the link. We hope you'll check it out and help us out on the fun drive. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube 
or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you, and we want you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Grateful thanks to our underwriters. The Annie Sinclair Knutson Memorial Fund, the Atherton Family Foundation, the Bernice and Conrad Von Ham Fund, Castle and Cook, Hawaii, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, Hawaiian Electric Companies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Integrated Security Technologies, Kamehameha Schools, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of ThinkTech, MW Group, the Omidyar Ohana Fund, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sidney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Eureka J. Sugimura. Thanks also to our viewers like you. Okay, Elise, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Elise does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the ongoing search for innovation wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elise Anderson. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.